at 9 over 1 a.m. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm going over. I'm sorry. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Erica, can you do the roll call, please? Yes. So we have Tom Dewey. Yep. Lauren Seeley. Arlene. I see her. Okay. Arlene Zorkman. Yes. Jean Christopher. Here. Katie Plum. Here. Lisa Gallagher. Here. Tracy DiFrancesco. Here. And Kendra Daniels. Let's go with event two. Approval of the minutes from October 18th, 2022. Do I have a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. All right. Any discussion or changes? <coughs> Hearing none, uh, let's vote. Uh, aye for approval. Aye. 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 All right. Yeah, she yes. raised her hand. Yes. <laughs> Motion uh, passes unanimously. Let's go on to item number three public invited to be heard. Oh, did you? Are you, are you, are you muted? Because we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Can't hear you, Lauren. Is this better? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Did you have something to say? I'm abstaining from voting because I wasn't at the last Okay, time. okay, you're just leaving. Okay. All right, now on to item three public invited to be heard. Let's see anyone from the public. Uh, let's go on to number four organizational updates. Today is a 2023 budget recap. Are you handling this, Kendra, or is this a uh, Carol thing? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, so, to kind of give you a, a, a breakdown of what we did, Um, but that's what, so we kind of did an average 
this analysis shows, so the yellow right now is the sum of the actual subsidy that's coming in. This is just a property that I took. This is a um, village place. Um, and I took certain units and just kind of did an analysis of what we're seeing. Um, the yellow is what we're being paid in subsidy. The gray is what the tenant is paying in actual rent. The orange is the sum of the potential rent, and the blue is what actual tax credit rent is today. So for this one, we're getting over, but we can do that for subsidized units because we could go up to the market rent and not necessarily the tax credit rent. Um, I'm gonna kind of go down to, so the very bottom one, that's a vacant unit. So the vacant unit's tax credit and we should expect the potential rent to be somewhere at that level when somebody gets put in. But you could have a situation such as um, this one, I don't know if you can see my, if you can see my arrows, um, but it's the third from the bottom. And this is what, the blue line is what our tax credit rent is today, but this is where this unit is. Um, and this could be several situations that are going on. It could be that they didn't get put in at the level that they were supposed to, which was happening. Um, and now they're, they're pretty far behind. But to increase them all the way to the top just wouldn't be sustainable for them. Um, so that's another reason why we went from the But that's what you can see in these older properties where we're kind of residing is that we may not be getting um, what we can. The second one is the same, same situation. This is what we're getting. This is our potential rent, but this is what we can get. Um, and this one does have subsidy. What we have found is that with some of the subsidy agencies, this probably isn't ours, but some of the subsidy agencies, they were going out and asking for market rent. So this potential unit, when it gets recertified, should be able to go up to market rent, but it's not at this time. So do you guys have any questions on that? I mean, I, I put the whole property in there, but you wouldn't have been able to see it if it's so tiny. <laughs> so I just picked, picked a, a few units. This will tell you what bedroom size is. One, and this is a 50%. Um, this is a 60. So Kendra, I have a question. Um, yeah. And I know that not everybody is going to be able to afford the actual increase. Are we going to end up putting people out um, and causing homelessness here, or are we going to be able, how are we going to work that? Um, well, I, I think every situation is individualized, so I think we would have to tackle that on an individual basis. I don't know that we would throw somebody out, per se. Um, I mean, Lisa might be able to talk more to how yeah, that happens that's okay. on, at the property level. Um, so I think, you know, for me it's been when I've been talking to the folks and we say everything's an individual situation and so we will evaluate the situations individually. Um, you know, part of it is when, when you re-syndicate, or not re-syndicate, when you re-up your lease, you have to give us all your financials anyway, right. and so you're required to pay certain things based on your financials. And the challenge we're having at Village Place is, unfortunately, when they were placing people in there, kind of before we took over, right as we were taking over, they weren't putting people in the appropriate units based on their income qualifications. Oh, oh, oh man. And so yeah. that's a problem. It's especially a problem when you talk about the fact that we have equity investors and other things we need to deal with. And so it may be that we go, here's what you need to do. You know, obviously we made the decision we're not going to the 17% that we were behind. We're, we're getting four yeah. and they have to incrementally stagger into it. But it may be that we go to someone that's having issues and we may start holding some 30, 40% AMI units or 
just managing what we have with the front block, Lisa. Um, third, we may manage what we have at the lower income units and say, here's what you need to pay, here's a place for you, you need to move. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's going to be a lot of balancing going on. Mm -hmm. I don't think, my gut tells me, I don't think we'll see a lot of that with 4%. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, it's individual, and, and actually village places are, are a worse situation. It's, um, it's got so many levels, too. Yeah, and places. for so long, people were put in there. Yeah. They weren't put in in the right units. Right, right. Yeah. Lower rent. Uh, lower rent, yeah. and they've been there for a long time. Yeah. When we look, there's a few maybe here. Mm -hmm. uh, Spring Creek and Fall River are pretty, they're in decent shape. Okay. Uh, Kendra, I'm, right, I'm correct in saying village place is our biggest problem. Oh, yeah, I would say village place Yeah. So, um, I mean, Aspen Memphis Senior has some issues as well. But not as many, but. Mm -hmm. And if they're voucher holders, mm -hmm. we may have to start figuring out how we use vouchers too to kind of bridge some of these issues as we're seeing them. But that's going to come up when their leases come up. Yes. Um, is there, uh, uh, this doesn't sound fair, but then neither does ousting somebody. Right. Um, uh, but could, um, could one of the options for somebody that is below get Section 8? Is there an option? Would there be an option for them? They would have to be on the wait list mm -hmm. and okay. wait for their turn. So okay. the last. Um, just for your guys' knowledge, the last waitlist opening we did at the end of October, mm -hmm. we had, what, 400, 600 people in person, but almost everybody who was local to Longmont got on the list because of the preference. Okay. So okay. we had a lot of residents. So, um, and, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, but really, we, um, even though the, the quick option is for them to move to a 30% apartment, what have you. Um, and I, I think, you know, move here. Uh, but the, and also the information and giving them the process for for getting on the wait list would be part of what. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be looking at all of that. And I think the key is, is when the release comes up. Yeah. So it's not like in January 1 we're going to have okay. everybody in these units. This. Yeah. They're going to be hitting based on their lease cycle. Right. And so we'll have some time to kind of understand and see. You know, I can tell you when we talk about the 4% increase, yeah. our lien's been in the, nobody's really freaking out about it. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and so I think even if they're 17% behind, mm -hmm. the max increase is only going to be. Right. So yeah. that's helping us manage kind of what you're concerned about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Obviously, when Kendra and I talked about this and said, if we brought them up where they needed to be, yeah, we would be having some yeah. serious issues, and we couldn't do that. And what we did here last year when we resyndicated, we actually added five 30 percent units. So I pulled the debit okay. for the, the income for the whole property and took the five lowest people yeah. and made their units to thirty percent, so okay. that it was going to those. Who needed it the most? Okay. So we're looking at that. We may have to do that in pre syndication so over there. Okay. Even here. The, this that's what we did here. Yeah, yes. that's seniors. Yes, here. Okay, so we, we had five thirds we didn't last year. We have 30%. No, we do yeah. now. We have five okay. right now. Yeah, and okay, so that's what great. we did is um, okay. I literally, me and Sarah bought, pulled the sheet, looked at everybody's income, and we're like, these are the lowest. They don't have a voucher. These are the people we're going to qualify for 30%. Yeah. And only those people were notified. Yeah. But as those become available, we'll start taking households that are all at 30% and seeing what we can do to help get them to that lower percentage. Okay. The other then, thing that we're looking at for Village Place with the resyndication, so it's not an immediate fix to some of this, but we are looking at asking for to project base quite a few vouchers. Yes. So in addition to those who have the tenant-based vouchers, we're looking at putting project-based vouchers. Obviously, that has to be approved by on the J board, but uh, that is definitely just with the level of 30% income individuals in Village Place when we have very little 30% units, um, that's something that we're planning on implementing with the resyndication. 
So that's over as a long term solution could could be helpful. Very yeah. And then, you know, it's, so I'm not incredibly worried about that. I mean, just because I think there's a lot of ways for us to manage it. And if push comes to shove, <clears throat> we can look at our affordable housing fund, we can look at other things if the numbers are just there. Mm -hmm. The numbers are going to lead us based on individuals' incomes. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're going to be able to, to manage this. I'm not. It's not one of the, now if we had done 17, I would come in and say, like, we're going to push people out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not incredibly anxious about it. I think there's ways for us to manage it. And as, as people's income has increased over the years, um, their Social Security, their rent has increased. Not 17%. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. But for under, understandable, but you know, last year was 5 point, this year it's going to be 8. So 4% is is actually lower. I I understand. Go ahead. I understand. Go ahead. Um, so given that we take income to determine what the rent is, and we haven't done that over the last yeah, I'm four years. Five years? Four years. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I appreciate what you said. It's just that, you know, a Social Security amount percentage isn't the same as the rent amount percentage. Yeah, yeah. And the impact is different because, that, yeah, but, yeah, and we all heard Social Security went, went up, you know, 5.8, and Medicare took most of it. Yeah. So the income, the usable income, uh uh. So, um, but I appreciate what you're saying and I appreciate what you're doing. One other question I had with the 30%, um, we had home units. I think there were two HLME city um, funded units in Aspen Meadows. I'm assuming those are protected too. No, no, it's, they were 50% home. And they were 50%? Yeah. Okay. And then, I think they were 30% in the neighborhood then. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so part of it is, I think, you know, we've obviously been learning ourselves through the budget. And sure. I think this is a, what I said to the, other, uh, to the board. Is that I think we're this is the first budget cycle where we're really comfortable. Right. Now we know what the world is, we know where it's going. Right. I think the message is um, this is why you want to incrementally step into rate increases every year because yes. it's easier to handle one or two percent on an annual basis than it is to handle a four or five percent. And so that's why you want to stay pretty much in lockstep with. Um, the tax credit rates and all of this because it, it's just way too hard. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we'll be evaluating it, but um, I think we have a lot of tools at our disposal yeah. in order to ramp people in there. Um, and I think most of them, it probably won't get, most of the leases come later in the year, I think. So it's not going to be a... Yeah, because... Um a lot of them are July. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them. But not the on slot is July. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to say, um, now I know I attended these meetings, and you have explained very, very well to the people what's going to happen. Um, I guess, and I've understood it very well. And I know that you said it's up to four percent. So some of them may actually be at less than four percent. Mm -hmm. And you've explained that very really well as as, as well. Um, when it comes to the actual time that they sign their lease, some of them may have forgotten what you said at that point. But you have done very well in explaining that over and over at <laughs> each unit. Yeah, I mean, when Arlene has asked you, I think I say this is an individual decision. Mm -hmm. I say that yes. 10 times. Yes. Because yes. I've been okay. pretty overt of saying you may have 4%, your neighbor may have 1%. Yes. And, and that's okay because yes. of where they're in. Mm -hmm. Trying, because what ends up happening? Yeah. And somebody goes, well, my rent only went up one percent, yeah. and they're in there. My fortune, and there, here we go. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, right. what we might want to do is videotape one of these, or videotape a session, and yes. then yeah. yes. have it on the website or something, or have it for the residents, where you, you all can start reminding them as we're moving for a four. Yeah. yeah. Or we add a piece to our recertification letter that we already sent out because that's when we do the lease. And have that as like a second page. This is what your rent is projected to do because we're just starting to write research 120 days ahead of time. 
So that will at least put a, give them a three, four month warning that this is coming, this is what it's going to be, and this is why. And here's, maybe we record one and go, here's where you can go to see what we're saying. That's a good suggestion. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned village place, you put people in wrong units. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? What is what it what are these AMI? AMI basically. So if somebody came to rent and they only had a 60% unit, mm -hmm. managed for that the time was like there even may have been 30 to 40% AMI mm -hmm. they put them in that sixty percent unit and just lowered the rent for the unit. Oh, so that they can afford it. Yeah. 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 The designated unit and not the right. Right. Okay. I got you. Yeah. So you'll have <clears throat> you'll have 60, 50, 40, 30. Right. And somebody, Katie comes in and she's on 30 percent. Hey, my person, they don't have anything available. They go, oh, we'll put you in the 60 percent AMI unit and lower your rent. Well, that's what's creating cash flow right. issues yeah. Yeah. and other things. Yeah. And yeah. now there is a point where you need to, you may have to do that. But we need process to to really instead of you know I mean and this was an issue we're dealing with with that property I mean we were seeing it but this is a point where if a situation comes up where if we have a sixty percent AMI unit that's been vacant for two months it may make sense to actually put somebody who's a forty or fifty percent in there because you're managing your income into the property. Mm -hmm. But those decisions have to come up into Kendra, Lisa, and myself and Molly because it works if you're doing it intermittently. But when you do it holistically for the property, which is kind of what we saw, that's a problem. Yeah, you got those one offs. Yeah, because you want to make your income coming in. But then when you when you do something like that, you need to mark that position. When you have the 30% AMI unit come available, you move them in it. I think when Sarah and I looked at it, there's like, there's only like eight or something, 30% units, and we have like 30 households under 30%. So those other 22 people are in units that need to be pulling higher rent, right. and they're not. So. One, of, one of the questions that comes up, um, because all the one bedroom apartments in here <clears throat> are the same square foot. And the rumors go crazy that, you know, some people are paying uh, like hundreds of dollars more now than what I've been here 10 years. I'm not paying what they're paying, which uh, I don't feel guilty about. I'm doing what I need to do. Mm -hmm. but. I can understand, it's it's one of those points where the residents don't quite get it, like I'm going to get slammed with hundreds of dollars in increase. And, and that's, that's a little, you know, why is somebody paying and, and explaining that whole AMI situation, um, like Arlene said, um, including that issue about square foot might be another another piece because it isn't based on square foot it's right. based on AMI and, 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 and that's one of the things yeah. that that every time I get it I have to clarify but it's all based on the year you moved in what the, the yes. rental rates were that year right. what happened in the special years yeah yeah but I'm I'm glad to see you know the four percent in the the top at this point because basically we could have done Four percent for the last three years, and we wouldn't be this far behind. But yeah. we couldn't do it because of instant, you know, the, in, lack of information, basically. And when we were in the board meeting, I know, um, I think it was Tim indicated that the board did approve a rate increase. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. We weren't involved then. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> And the board may have approved it, but we can't see that they implemented it. So, 2018, there, it looks like it did go in, and then there was some for 2020, but with COVID and everything, it doesn't, across the board, we cannot see where it was no. rolled out. It wasn't rolled out. I think the 2018 was, because 
we had just stepped in. I think it was like 2020. We've been kindering out the numbers before. This has been right when Julian was leaving. No, this is before. Because it was before. Yeah. Yeah, because when when we got there, I was working with a bunch of the tenants concerning the rays that had just come into effect. That was 2020. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so there was, a, I think, a 2018, I think, was the last increase. That's the last increase I got. Was yeah, we that, I was still dealing yeah. with it. Right in March of 2020, and that's yeah. the only thing. It could have been that. Yeah, we, can't, but we can't see it in, in there, even in fact of 2018. And so, you know, it is what it is. You can't, you know, yeah. you can't look back. You gotta look forward. I don't think yeah. we're, in, we're in a decent spot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it explains the revenue issues. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can start seeing the, mm -hmm. you can start seeing the desk model. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, I will move on to the suites. The suites is a little different because they are all our PVD vouchers, mm -hmm. and we have to get POH's approval. Um, to increase that vouchers to the market rent. I, they have not been doing that. Um, we did get approval at the end of 2021 to increase the vouchers to um, a zero bedroom would increase to 1,274, a one bed, so our one bedroom, we were getting 1,174 and we got it increased to 1,428. So we were losing out a lot on the suites which the suites has a lot of the biggest expenditures, such as security and their insurance is out the wazoo now. Um, and the two bedroom, they didn't really give us an approval for that. Um, so we just kind of did um, a, an average of what they were giving us for the zero and one bedroom to move it to 1678. These increases are similar to the Hearthstone and the Lodge where unless the, the tenant income increases, they're not affected, it'll, it'll be uh, absorbed by the subsidy. Um, and have these been approved or are we still waiting for approval? The, the approved, the 1274 and the 1428, I don't know why they didn't include the two bedroom. I need to take a look at that. One of them, one of the two bedrooms is probably the manager's unit, um, but the other two bedroom, I don't know if that's an MHP, which still, goes through GOH, or they just didn't realize we didn't have two bedrooms. So, so mental health to get just some update from GOH on that. Mental health pays the correct amount, right? Or they are supposed to pay the correct amount. Mental health has agreed to, and you guys correct, I don't know the, the language that you guys use, but they have agreed to go up to these. So the EOH approved it for both SHA, MN, and MHP vouchers. And then, Lisa, can you speak? Have the notices gone out? For the suite? To the tenants regarding the 4% increase? No, because we've been educating them at Hopping Conversations, and then I figured this month we'll get a notice out after we kind of do that educational piece with Hopping Conversations. Mm -hmm. When do we have to get that notice out, Kendra? It's 30 days. It has to be 30 days. Mm -hmm. So I think we probably, depending on when the coffee and conversations, I think we need to get it out sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we could probably get Spring Creek, Fall River. I think we could go ahead and do Village Place because in that meeting we didn't talk about specifics, but we did talk about um, a rent increase and then we can back it up. And I don't need today there for a coffee and conversations without yeah. you. So without I, mean, yeah. I can let them know because you did touch on it at the last coffee yeah. conversations. Yeah, so I think we can. And ask this is tomorrow. Am I here? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we'll get them out this week. Because um, we've already done the lodge in our stuff. Mm -hmm. Some other new items um, going into the They all on Kendra, Jean has a question. Okay. I, I have a concern, but it, it may not be a concern anywhere. Lisa, you might know. Um, but whenever we had an increase before, it had to be a 60-day notice for Boulder County Housing. 
Has that changed? If there was somebody on a Boulder County housing voucher. The, the house, voucher holders' rents won't change with this LIPEC increase. Oh, okay. This is those who are paying their rent. Yeah. Their own rent. Because the voucher, vouchers are separate. All right. They only pay 30% of their gross income. Yeah. In. Yeah. All I'm saying is that when, when we had, you know, effective January 1, blah, 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 mm -hmm. we had to let Boulder County know. And we, the managers do that separately on a separate form when they do their renewals. They have to do okay. a form that goes into each housing authority. Okay. And that, my, my concern, if we've got somebody in January, yeah. Those ones have already started, current already working. All right. Awesome. Okay. Just, you know, one of those nagging little things. And just so you know, they're, well, we talk, I talked to them about um, white papering all of these processes. So that we have standard operating procedures, and they're building a manual, so that <clears throat> it, you know. Last week I was saying if we win the lottery, <clears throat> obviously that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> but if you know, but if, if something occurs and we have transitions, there's literally a manual for somebody to go to and pick it up, so you don't have kind of what we got into where we're like, where's this? What's this? Mm -hmm. It's going to be packaged up for anyone to come in and just go. Yeah. Well, Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the certifications are usually done 60 days in advance, yeah. anyways. Correct. So. Okay. Um, so there are some new components in the, in the budget. Um, LHA has added a police component to our budget. Um, we will be contributing a percentage of pay to the city of Walmart's police position, and that's Sarah's position to help assist with law enforcement needs on our properties, including evictions. Okay. Um, I don't know if anybody has, if you want to elaborate on that, Harold, or if anybody has any questions before I go, like what the increases across the board are. Yeah, I think, just to talk about that, um, I think what we did is, you know, what we're finding is, <clears throat> sorry, we were using Sarah a lot. Right. And, in many ways, we were, you know, Sarah was getting overtime, <clears throat> doing all these things, and I needed to balance it out on the police side. Sorry, I lost it. It's allergies. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> so we were balancing it out on police, and um, and so what we did is we put this position. She'll come in. Part of it is to help um, Lisa with the evictions yeah. because um, it was getting more and more difficult for me to help Lisa with evictions. You know, there were, you know, after her um, significant eviction at Fall River, I think the next time we did it, Eric was able to get some time for me to do it. So it's really going to tag team somebody with Lisa in this. Um, it's also uh, to help. Molly and I a little bit with some issues that Lisa can't handle because of her workload. And so um, she also does crime free multifamily housing. So we're sort of bringing the housing components generally. She'll still work for Zach, but also work for me. And so Zach and I've talked a little bit about this and, and what we're doing. But what we're going to be able to do is then backfill a position in police so that we can put someone on the streets, maybe bring someone else up. To um, the world that Lisa and Dave Kennedy are in, but Zach and I are working on this. But we were using her so much, it just was, I had a backfill. Yeah. And this will give us more regularity and certainty in terms of, you know, what Sarah can do and how she can help us. So, then how much of the salary, like percentage wise, are we going to be providing with? What was the number that we put in, Lisa? Fifty-six thousand. Okay. It's like, or not, Lisa? Kendra, what was the number? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I don't have that. <laughs> I did not have pulled up. I have sixty-six thousand six hundred ninety-three dollars. That's probably about right. I think it was around. Is that just the salary piece? That, I'm just looking at whatever the consultant's law enforcement might have has. That be that would be benefits and salary, I'm assuming, right? Uh, it should be yeah. yes. Right. 
Oh, I mean. And I think that's about right because I think it was during the salary was about. About seventy percent, and then sixty percent. So, and we're, so we're going to get that time dedicated, or is it an as-needed basis? Um, dedicated. Basis. I'm actually. That's where Zach and I are working to try to find other funds. Maybe just fill it okay. completely, and then it becomes. Yeah, sixty-six thousand dollars. <throat> yeah. So, um, step one on the police officer is. Um, that would have filled it in 22. In 23, it's uh, 70,632. Uh, so, in all, it's 93,000, you know, fully burdened. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, two thirds, you know, we've got about a third left that we've got to bring in. And so, Zach and I are trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're, we did it as step one just because we always have step ones on it, unfortunately. <clears throat> Back to you, Kendra. Okay. So um, it, there are increases across the board. Um, what we found with the salary and benefits to retain staffing is moving from anywhere from 6 to 12%. Um, we kept with kind of the city standard where you will at least get a minimum of six, but your max is 12. We did have um, a couple of the, I believe it was the maintenance positions that were going over the 12%, but um, they are going out and they have included us in their, um, their survey that they're doing through, what company is it, Harold? Mercer. Mercer? Um, yes. To kind of get a better idea of exactly, because uh, the problem is, is that the surveys that we're getting, only like six or seven housing authorities submit to these surveys. So you could have something really high one year and then really low the next. And so it's just not a very good um, benchmarking. So we've been included in those surveys to see exactly where everybody falls. Um, utilities are increasing at an average of 5%. Um, and that's across the board. Um, insurance is increasing. What we did find out, we had our insurance company kind of say, like, for our market, because we hadn't been increasing um, the amount insured for the businesses, and I found that out last year, so we did increase some of it last year, is that our insurance amounts were a lot lower than what we built it for. Um, what we were finding is that standard practice should be around 200. Um, dollars per square foot, and several of our properties were under that. Village Place was really under that. So we're incrementally increasing them to get that sustainable that we did have a total loss. We have money coming in. So we do have um, insurance increasing, and I just found out yesterday that uh, Fall Rivers Loan reached out to Carrie, our insurance agent, and they are wanting the exact same thing that the suites required, which is for our wind and hail coverage, we can't have a deductible over $25,000. So we're going to have to get another separate insurance quote, which for the suites, that cost about $25,000. So Fall River is going to have a change to their budget line item for their insurance um, based on what they're requiring for the loan. Um, we do have in increases due to inflation across the board. I mean, most of what we're seeing is anywhere from 4 to 5% um, for our third party subcontractors. Um, and that includes pest, elevator, you know, those type of entities. Um, we did try um, and at math reserves where we could and at capital, capital expenditure reserve. I mean, we have replacement reserves and those are for specifically for stuff that was already in the property when it was built and we can use those replacement reserves to replace that. But we haven't allowed for any type of capital expenditures if there's any new changes that want to happen. So we want to make 
make sure we start adding that reserve so that we can take care of this, um, these items, and the, and the requests from the residents, you know, what they like to see um, in these properties as well. So Kendra, I have a question, which kind of goes along with that. Several of the places do not have a meth reserve or capital improvement reserve, um, and there are places that I'm pretty sure have had meth problems with them. Is that coming out of reserve replacement, or are we just going to eat that somewhere in the budget? So, so a lot of, so it's kind of a stepping stone. So you can have a meth unit that just needs cleaned. That's usually not, you know, unless a cleaning wouldn't constitute a replacement reserve because you're not really replacing anything. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily something that we can't ask the investors. Usually we have to send all of our costs to the investors to get approval to take it from the replacement reserve. But for example, let's say you have a unit that needed all kinds of replacement. Well, anything over 5,000 is obviously gonna go through insurance. So we would only be out the $5,000 um, for the deductible. But what we also need to kind of work on is we don't know if they're gonna continue with as many meth units as we've seen, I'm sure other housing authorities are seeing the exact same thing, that they may not have that coverage in the future. And then we're gonna be at, at a big loss trying to pay for these meth units forward going because a lot of the private entities um, can't get this type of insurance. So they're out. And I know there's been people coming to the Longmont City Council um, talking about this, private landlords that are able to get this type of insurance. Yeah. And they're out a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of prepping for that as well. What did you say the, the MEV uh, deductible was for the insurance? It's 5000 right? Yeah. Those would cover us for two. Yeah, and usually <laughs> the cleans are under five. Okay. So if it's just, you know, but if you have five units that all need clean, it's going to add up eventually. So mm -hmm. if that's not in the budget, we do put some in the budget for that um, health. It's I think it's health and safety, um, but it may not be enough with what we're seeing today. So with the insurance renewal, did we bring up the um, like the, the testing of meth on a Renewal we did. Of lease. Um, <laughs> we wanted to make sure we got binding contracts. <laughs> we wanted to make sure we got insured before we went that route. Okay. Um, they are concerned that we could lose our coverage, um, and we may have to go out to market. So there's only a few companies that actually do housing authority insurance, and so if we get put out in, I can't remember what they called it, but if, if we can't get insured by those companies, we have to go out to the other market, and it's gonna be a big increase. I know we're gonna circle back with the insurance companies, but I think they were somewhat a little leery about what it could end up costing in the beginning, and at what risk are we of losing our insurance. I don't know if you want to add anything, Harold, or... No, I just think, um, yeah, we've got to work with them and figure it out. We, uh, Molly did, um, Molly and Katie went on a tour of a facility in Denver, and it looks like the company in New Zealand um, is marketing their meth detectors now. They're marketing their meth detectors. There's actually a few companies in New Zealand, Australia, which is interesting that they're really probably leading the pack in terms of this work. And so with the group in Denver and Molly, I think they were um, trying to figure out how we can, what is it, get either demonstration detectors or get them to come up to the U.S. and talk about what they're doing. So they're tamper-proof, they're, it's like a smoke detector, but Obviously, more complicated. And it goes in each individual unit. Yeah, oh, they're five hundred dollars per unit, but you know the reality. I mean, they're expensive, but the reality is, you know, you save one full remediation of a unit, and you're you're, you're positive. 
Um, based on the number, and we, we may look at the insurance companies and see if they want to split it or do something. But. I just wanted to mention, I asked um, our office about the insurance company and we were approached by a company, I can't remember if it was the same one or if it's a different one, about putting those in our units. And you know, she requested a lot of sort of paperwork, like show me how sensitive they are, how they work, and she wanted all this like data backing it up, backing up the claims before we committed to paying five hundred dollars a unit. And um, they weren't able to give that, her any of that information, and they weren't willing to do a pilot program either so that our staff could test the sensitivity. Because if, you know, there's a big difference between, you know, residual, detecting a residual amount and then detecting actual use. And then, you know, she was saying that there was other instances where it was being set off by other substances that weren't meth. And so um, I would just caution, make sure you're getting whatever proof you need before agreeing to any of that, because we, we did not have any luck with um, testing out those meth detectors. And this might have been a couple of years ago, but um, if you want to, Molly, if you want to talk to Amanda about it and get some more backup information and just find out what you should be asking for that we weren't able to get, let me know and I can put you in contact with her. Yeah, that'd be great. Part of what we may think about doing is um, buying a couple and um, um, seeing if police and could do a controlled test in our in our evidence area where we do things with, with hoods to kind of see what would trigger. And, and again, that's probably more for Sarah to come in and help us with to see. Um, not to get into a dissertation on that, but the problem is the chemical components can change. And so it's understanding can it really register all the chemical components? So the Aspen Meadows, you know, this, um, Aspen Meadows Senior Apartments is not having that much of an increase um, just due to the type of um, situations there. This is another unit similar to Village Place. Um, so we weren't able to do a meth reserve or a capital improvement reserve there with all the increases on admin um, and maintenance and operations. Along with utilities, um, there just wasn't enough left in the budget to, to do that. We are able to do it at Aspen Meadows neighborhood, which is a good thing because their reserve is not very big, like some of the other properties. Um, and we have a feeling, you know, all the rooms are going to have to be replaced all at once, and <laughs> it's it will not have enough to probably accomplish that if that's the case. But I also think um, similar to so we went out. That was really nice for the Hearthstone the Lodge the Village Place, and we kind of got a company to say, here's where each property stands, and here's when you're going to need to replace this. And that's what we don't have for the other properties, um, but it would be nice to establish that so we know what to budget for if we need to replace um, the water heaters, the boilers, or the, the roofing, um, or those type of things to actually have um, a good maintenance schedule for for uh, future budgets. Does anybody have any questions on Aspen campus? So Fall River and Spring Creek. Oh, a so, go ahead. Okay. Um, so you know they're the same thing. We kind of started in that in a capital um, improvement measure. Um, they're not looking. All that bad with the increases. Um, in fact, Spring Creek's looking pretty, pretty good on their side. Um, also, realize most of these properties still have developer fees that have to pay in. Um, so, having some type of cash at the, at the end of the year. Um, and realize we also don't account for the HTD units. So, if there are HTD units in this property, we don't budget for those. Um, it's kind of hard. Per se, um, and, and we don't know if those people are going to If they leave, then we lose that voucher, so we wouldn't be getting um, the subsidy piece of it. 
downtown campus for Village Place and Briarwood. Um, I did small on the Briarwood apartments, um, but we also, when we refinanced the loan to the Briarwood apartments, we were able to um, refinance a little more so we could put a reserve replacement um, for that property because there was none. Um, so we do have, I think, $30,000 right now for reserve replacement. Um, and so I'm looking to at least always add to that as well each year. And Village Place, um, with the increase, we are getting a little more um, admin expense went down. Um, that is mainly because of probably the But it could be several situations where we had different people budgeted there last year um, that had different incre incremental increases this year um, and how they're splitting their salary. So this person's salary is being split now because at last year I believe we only had somebody at Village Place and now their admin is being split between both properties because that person is taking on both properties. Whereas I think last year Lisa was taking one bright wing part. <laughs> so on the so your the, the reserve replacement calculation, how are we budgeting for that if we haven't done like reserve studies without understanding, right? The lodge and the Hearthstone you said were the only ones that had reserve studies. So how are we um, so it's not reserve, so reserve replacement is specific to the agreement with oh. the properties. So it's usually an amount per unit, and depending on, and each, each property is different. Some of them say, like some, for example, some of them are like $300 per unit uh, for the entire year, and then maybe by the fifth year, you increase it 3% every year. So all of these, we have a, I have a whole different spreadsheet yeah. that tracks. <laughs> so it's per the agreement and not necessarily what the needs are of the facility. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's per the agreement. And what we found out in this last with the Barstow and Lodge, which we probably, with our MOR on it, is we had to submit this form that hadn't been done in forever. And this form actually, not only can, you can increase your reserves, but you could also increase your management fees, which they haven't done that at all at the Barstow and Lodge. Um, and based on the calculation, we should be able to increase those. Um, so that will definitely be an ask for next year. Um, but yeah, reserve replacements, the meth reserve and capital improvement reserve, this is kind of a let's get it started. Right. And we probably right. need to figure out what the best, you know, based on the property, what the best methodology. And, you know, Sweets is obviously probably going to have a higher one than than others. Uh, Lisa, you said that you were going around with your maintenance folks too to see what is in need and that. Or are you going out like long term to see and dollar wise how, how much you're going to need for that sort of thing? Some of that came into play from budgets this year. So we did our first one, we have our second one scheduled for this year. Mm -hmm. um, but doing that helped us build what we need mm -hmm. on each of the properties. Basically, we went through storage and saw what we had. Um, a lot of our grounds need a lot of curb and fill work that and so we were able to start getting quotes, start putting those into the budgets between and then this year, beginning of next year, to get some of that stuff covered. But you were looking at like roofing also. Yes, yeah, so I was on roofs, I was painting yes, the um, property windows, okay. taking some of these capital needs assessments we had that into play too. Okay. And it really helped Kendra and I with these budgets this year. And are we are you are you comparing that to what the reserve replacement is, or just to see if we're going to be close, or are we underfunded, overfunded? Well, the reserve replacements we we have no we can only request to use funds from right. Yes. So, but the, the capital improvement reserve is what we're building based on some of those costs. Okay. That won't be covered by the reserve replacement. Correct. Because if we're adding like example, we want to take the mulch out and put rock out. Correct. Since we're Completely, we're not replacing with the same thing. We can't use our reserve replacement, mm -hmm. so the capital would come into play on that. But some of those, you know, from what you're saying, I think, and, and we said we probably need to maybe figure out a, a program. I, you know, I don't know if there's a software program that the maintenance could use to start understanding, like similar to what we got with the Hearthstone and Lodge, and maybe we actually contract with that company to do the other properties. 
so that we have that, you know, when is the roof being replaced, when is this, and then we can get those scheduled out. And some of those are with reserve replacement, so I see where you're coming, Tom. Yeah. We should see exactly, are we going to have, and that's that's what this company did as well, is like, here's what you're going to need by this point. Um, <clears throat> yeah, are we, are we going to have enough reserve replacement built up to support that, yeah. or do we, yeah, it's going to yeah. have to come out of other needs. And I, I do think that's a tool that the staff might need, Some of this can actually on a spreadsheet that Cameron was working on from the city when I started, and we've added some things to it that they kind of gave me a lifespan of each of the items. So we may be able to pull from that and work on that. Yeah. And then I just we we'll, we'll just do like fair market value yes. uh, of some of the yeah mm -hmm. some purchases. That's what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be nice to have something like that developed in 2023. Um, so that. Things that are 
not dating you, knowing that there's always going to be an increase. And I'm sure they're seeing inflation as well <laughs> with the costs that are being submitted. Um, but we should be okay there. We have done, we are budgeting. Um, Tracy, the two housing specialists, our accounting team is budgeted there as well as our new administrative um, assistant um, that's at the front desk now. So those are being budgeted through the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Any questions there? I don't see. And then our SRO program, our SRO program is pretty tight, similar to our Cardstone and our large budgets. Um, we had been over budgeting in the past by quite a bit, and what happens with that is that you don't get paid <laughs> for the first four or five months. Um, because HUD's taking back the money that you got overpaid in the prior year. So we're trying to get that budget a little closer so we're not having to always pay back in our, our cash is um, pretty consistent coming in. So this is for the um, in-between. And they also have the opportunity to convert to a RAD program as well, if we want to see about that in the future. And then you have 615 Main and Briarwood office. These are both properties um, that are pretty tight, especially Briarwood office um, with, the, with the refinancing. Um, we do play, pay some utilities, but we also get um, you're going to see a utility expense for Briarwood office, but those expenses are built back um, 40%. So we pay 60% for the apartments and 40% for the office, so it's built back and, and close to direct. Um, and then 615 Main, which is, well, both of these properties are looking to be sold, um, but I think we're still in the process of reviewing that and seeing what that would be. Market value, right? What's that? We'll do, we'll do appraisals and, and, and go through that. So, yeah. Unless, unless the board or somebody goes, just goes to whatever they're going to own. But, yeah, we'll really have to go through and do all the appraisals. I think we have to do that. Anyway, because of all the rules. So. so, the LAG General Fund, we are having the use fund balance. We have the use fund balance every year. The other revenue of $521,000, realize that is the management fees that are coming in based on the revenue projection. Um, we get those off of gross receipts received. So, as long as we're collecting, uh, we get a percentage of that um, paid back to us. And then you have 150000 of corporate management fees that are actually paid in by LHTC. So once LHTC is dissolved, we will not have those funds coming in, and we would probably have to have more fund balance needed unless we can find some other revenue that's a continued revenue that comes in to support the admin that, that's needed. Um, our admin is, expense has been running around eight hundred thousand, um, and that's that's been pretty standard. And it's been pretty standard that we've had to do about four hundred thousand of, of fund balance. Um, realize our fund balance in the LHH general fund right now is it at, is at about seven hundred thousand dollars. So we're using this fund balance with biggest <coughs> three, um, but we should hopefully be seeing some. Developer fees coming in from AMSA this year. Um, once it's dissolved, once LHTC is dissolved, we would probably be seeing Fall Rivers developer fees coming in. But um, we're not seeing any developer fees from the Christmas project until 2024. So we should be, be getting our fund balance up by 2024 with the Christmas developer fees. Um, but we need to keep the development going or find another consistent revenue 
the stream coming in. Kendra, did you see my email on, there was a small portion of the paid developer fee that we should have gotten for Christmas. Did we get that? I think I sent an email, but I didn't know if we... So that, that you mean when they closed? Yeah, there were, I know we got paid like the like special limited partner fee, but there was also another chunk of the paid developer fee that we should have gotten paid that we didn't directly from the title company. Well, that was in 2022. That's not in 2023. Okay, yeah, I just I just want to make sure we got it. Yeah, I, I think it was the $44,000. Okay. Yeah, we did get that. Um, but none coming in in 2023. So we did give us a little cushion of fund balance um, so that we would have some net income in case we ran into some situations. But hopefully we can save the net budget for having an additional situation. So that's, that's what it is. You just put, the reason why you have that income is just for the cushion? Yeah, okay. it's just for the cushion. Yeah, okay. right. um, and you know, I'll report like, and this is similar to um, LHTC, as you'll see when we go through the financial. Pretty much, we're always using fund balance for them at the moment. So I'll kind of show how much fund balance we've had to use for that property, and I do the same thing for this um, if it comes down to it. <coughs> and and, and Kendra, so on that point, Kendra did talk about. The fact that um, we, uh, for HCD voucher holders, we don't budget the full amount for those individuals because they're portable. Mm -hmm. That's also a cushion for us in terms of the operating revenue mm -hmm. because that typically makes up. So why we don't have pure financial, why we're not in the negative in some properties is because of the vouchers that we're bringing in. So they're overcoming that. So. Usually almost every um, investor report says, here's why we're over revenue and here's why we're over management expenses <laughs> or man over management fees because our revenue is increased, so is our management fees. It's based off the percentage of the grocery receipts we receive. For the LHDC general fund, we are using um, full fund balance um, <coughs> because most of what that, the $50 is probably that's not, that's not calculated, right? <laughs> that should be a total. Um, it's probably interest that comes in, but the admin expense is literally um, the a majority of the corporate management fees they pay to the LHA. And then, and then it's going to have also some audit expense because they have their own audits. HBC does as well. So that's the majority of what those admin expenses are. So I know you talk about this dissolving. Is there any idea of when this is going to happen? Oh, HBC? Mm -hmm. uh... The attorney is working on the approvals right now. Um, part of it, we have to chat about Village Place because Village Place is owned by. LHGC and moving that around before the resyndication is a little sticky. So we're not going to, we're going to do the resyndication and the resyndication of the, that will be what moves it over into LHA simply mm -hmm. similar to what we did here. Okay. So then that leaves Spring Creek, Fall River, um, the, the attorneys working on Lodge and Hearthstone, that's the working with the HUD and the 202. Um, we kind of had to get through this audit that we had with HUD um, to, I guess, have them have the confidence that we could operate it. And I think we're just, have we gotten a letter yet? Yeah, no, we should be any day now. Um, but um, when Molly and I met with the guy that was leading the audit, um, we did a lot better than we did before on that large our stuff. Actually, he told us in that that. Um, so we had like a, a fail when we first took it over. Um, and he said, the only reason you got points is because the building in the, was in good shape. If you would have had issues with the building, you probably wouldn't have had any points. That's how bad it was. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think we're going to be much better, and I think that'll help us. And then that only leaves 
think that's it, right? There's a hover land. Too. So that's the one that easy enough. To that's the one that we're going to talk about on the development right. project, and that'll convert over. That was easy. That's that was an easy, easy one, yeah. yeah. So um, time issues are going to be HUD, and it's going to be mm -hmm. the resyndication of Village Place. Yeah, I think Village Place will be. That was a question I had for you eventually, but was that'll be the longest? So that's talking about life site closing next, the end of next year. So everything else could happen well before that. Yeah. Village place is kind of out. Yeah, there. Just wait for that one and then yeah. yeah. pull the trigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but I have to leave at ten thirty. Yeah, we're, we're at, this so ends at ten thirty, so we're gonna have to. Um, I wanted to move up the the fraud thing so I could. Summary page the vacancies are we using 96 percent on that? Yes. Have we been at 96 or it looks like we're averaging about 92, 93 right percent? Now. Yeah, we were. we were at that. Okay, so okay. All right. Uh, the 4B LHA advisory board recruitment. So this one, Molly asked me to speak on. Um, as you all know, the application process up and down on October 19th and will close on November 30th. Um, and the LHA Board of Commissioners need to do their deliberations on December 10th. So we need to have this board have their recommendations in by December 6th, which is a Tuesday. Um, currently, there's nine applicants and um, the interviews either need to happen on Thursday, December 1st, Friday, December 2nd, or Monday, December 5th. So I guess what would you guys like to schedule in with Molly and LEG staff to do those interviews? So it's me and Jean, right? Correct. Okay. Oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Monday and Friday. Um, so Friday would have to be in the afternoon. Okay. The 2nd. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to be going that next week. Oh, so we need to do them on Friday. Thursday, 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 and Friday. Okay. Thursday and Friday. Thursday morning and Friday afternoon. What? But I was going to tell her, um, Lonnie from Cornerstone Living um, was trying to find the application. So I will. somebody sent it to him and then he didn't find it. Okay. So Thursday, because you know, I'm okay Thursday, um, but Friday I've got. I wouldn't be available until after after two. So maybe Thursday would be. Thursday. I don't know. That's gosh. If we've already got nine, that's but there are going to be about fifteen if we did it. Yeah, and it will be recorded. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, good. So. Okay. Okay. So I can definitely schedule for both. I could do Thursday for a longer period of time, and then just maybe eat the last couple for Friday afternoon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Are you doing it electronically or are we doing face to face? I would just prefer face to face. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's what I'm going to do. As long as we can see the yeah. where, where are we going to have them? Right down at the city or where? Really, where are we actually? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're trying to push the interviews into certain days, I would do have the option for both because if somebody has a work issue, then that, that could be a problem. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you're going to do both in person or that, I would do it either in my conference room or the first scene conference room, where we can have you sit up and we have people there to help with technology. Yeah, and I like it not being on one of the campuses. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah because then 
those software room have the camera and everything, and it's mm -hmm. pretty easy to, mm -hmm. to work. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, let's go on the next one. Well, let's just go down to from the tenant front policy number six. So this policy, as I don't know if you recall, but in the admin plan there was a um, section on fraud, and um, that was that was the policy that was put into the admin plan. This policy is um, more for the staff, for the community managers, um, in the process of what what we do when we when we find um, suspected. So um, it's it's just we we wanted to make sure that all the staff knew that we were responsible for detecting fraud and that there's steps that we need to take to um, verify it and then what happens after it's verified. Um, ultimately, again, in the in the admin plan. It, it states that one of the consequences could be um, that we turn it over to the police department for investigation. Mm -hmm. And this just says the whole thing. And it does um, state about confidentiality, what LAJ staff needs to do to keep things confidential. Yeah. Really just comes down to the executive director. Deciding. Making the decision, yeah. especially with um, if if we're going to send it to the police, then, mm -hmm. then I think it's, it's really the executive director that needs to direct staff to do that. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Where, so where do we document then if we suspect anything? Is there a place in the Yardie or in the file that we're we'll so, um, in, like if we monitor it? Or what, what the actions are? Um, so we've only, most of the ones that we have found so far, um, we've entered into promissory notes. And they're paying on a monthly, and that's set up to the county. Um, and that, that's tracked somewhat in Yardie, but um, because the LHA can keep 50% of the payment, and then the rest has to be fraud. It has to be sent back to, to HUD. So that's done through a county. Um, there are two. One that has already been sent over. Um, she's the one that was evicted from suites, and there's a bunch of meth down there. Um, so there's going to be there's going to be other things. But there was some fraud under the project based voucher program. And that was sent over to the police department, and then we've got one other one that we're yeah, I think so. And these weren't just unreported income; it was forging documents from the courts or forging documents from the doctor. So, only from the one, so Tracy comes and goes, "Here's what's going on." I go, "Yeah, we need to, we need to push this over." The one Eric and I need to finish is I had Eric to go in and, and basically take everything Tracy did. All the other issues kind of line it out and mm -hmm. just kind of go through it and then via a, be a letter mm -hmm. you know we're going to go here's my decision here's this and we're turning this over yeah and that shows that no we have to notify them yeah that they are the, so the charges are filed and that follows these people Jeez. throughout mm -hmm. the so yes. another step that I do is in PIC. So we have to we have to run a background, and it's through a government. Um, it's a HUD secured system, and so we we put in the applicant's um, social security number, and we get all of the IRS information on on, on that. So what I do is I also go into that system, and I'll say that the AOS. And that stops them from getting any other assistance anyplace. So all housing authorities have to go into that system and pull those routers. And it comes up with their social security. Yeah, that's our obligation to HUD yeah. in these right. processes. And so um, they're already in the system. You know, the criminal pieces, it's also our obligation on HUD to, anytime we see fraud, to turn it over. 
and if we don't do it, and then they find that they've committed fraud in other agencies, and then they come to us and go, well, did you see it? And we go, yeah, I mean, we're, then we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a, um, generally HUD, I was telling them, I mean, I had, uh, on the CBG side of my last community, a staff member in a federal court case for about two weeks. Um, fortunately for us, he was the one that actually found it. And what they ended up finding is that the individual defrauded multiple governmental agencies mm -hmm. on federal funds that was related to Katrina. And that number got big in a hurry, and that person got prison time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's our obligation, and we don't really have a choice. And it doesn't, I don't report um, any um, like damages or anything from the properties, it's just all under the HCB. Um, I think we also do that under the 202, since those are Molly asked me to come um, for that um, since she had vacation. Um, I don't know how much in depth you guys want me to go, but uh, Zinnia um, is there uh, doing their flat and site submittal for the city. Um, they are going tonight um, to city council to get 100% fee waivers. Um, so that uh, they were administratively approved the 50% just based upon the project. Um, and, and then in order to get more, they have to get that approval. So that will be determined um, tonight. Um, but other than that, that project's moving forward as planned. They hope to close um, financial closing and start construction in the late spring, early summer, so like May, June. Um, the land closes? They're hoping to buy the land from us um, before the end of the year. So they had to wait, obviously, for the plat to be redone because you can't buy land that doesn't have bound. You know, they had to separate it before they buy it. So, um, so yeah, they plan to buy that before the end of the year. Um, and then they'll pay back our, the city for their loan that they took out for that. Um, Chrisman, nothing really to update there. That's going as planned under construction. Um, Hover, we put out the RP for development partner and development partner team and had really good responses. We had nine responses and we interviewed four um, and we did select Penrose um, alongside their um, architect and general contractor that they recommended. Um, so we just informed them of that yesterday and so you know the next step with that is kind of just getting a meeting and talking about next steps and you know what makes sense so um, but as far as like selecting somebody and getting that going I think is a good good first step so um, that's where that one is uh, village place lots going on there uh, we just put out the RFP for the architect which is very timely um, we hope to submit to Chapa for the 4% application in the spring um, and we really need the architect on board ASAP. So um, we hope to have them selected before Christmas. Um, so, but yeah, that's really timely. Um, we're working on the CNA still, um, which is important for the architect to see. So it's kind of all moving at the same time, but um, working with Sarah um, on all the things that we'll need for the application. Um, we talked a little bit about the set aside issue uh, what we're looking at is, um, like I said, I think we've talked about like 19 project-based vouchers in addition, of, in addition to the couple of housing choice vouchers that are already in the building. Um, we obviously, there's a process to go through with that. Um, but then reducing the amount of 60% units, because there is quite a few there now, so reducing those and turning those into 50% units to kind of match, better match the population and then also the project-based vouchers will really help out with that issue there. Um, and then uh, getting WNC out, we did have good progress there. We thought we were going to have to find a um, third party to do a right of first refusal trigger. Um, they're going to let us buy the interest, which is much less complicated um, and 
you know, I talked to Lauren about um, Boulder Housing Partners being able to do that, and they did consider that. So um, thankful for that, but also thankful we don't need it because <laughs> um, it's much easier for us to just buy the interest. So um, hopefully they'll be out of the deal by the end of the year, January. Um, is kind of the hopeful. We want them out before we go in for the 4% application. So, and that's kind of, that's quick because I know we don't have a lot of time here. I can touch on anything else if you want. so fast and, and it was amazing and you know Thursday we'll have our second trip I understand nine people have signed up oh, yes. um, and uh, it, it, uh, the fact that you guys pulled the team together and did it uh, and worked with the uh, it, it was awesome and and I just appreciate not only um, that it's done but you did it so smoothly and quickly I uh, uh, it's hard to do that in this environment, and I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful. And obviously, a lot of people here are too. Now I'll pass it on to Alberto and Tim Holt because they actually did the contract and work. And, and that's the that. work. Yeah. That, that was the piece. We thought we yeah. were going to have a purchasing issue, we didn't, and so awesome. Yeah, so they did the yeah. job. Yeah, please pass it on. Um, a lot of people here are grateful. And I actually rode the first time, which was very, very exciting. I'm going to go again this week, um, as long as it's true. Well, they said they got us the 20 passenger buses and then the 12 one that we originally promised. So, yeah. And that yeah. has made a, a yeah. really great difference. So. Uh, yeah. And, and the inclusion of the uh, container bags. And I have more of those. It's just awesome. Oh, yeah. Awesome, girl. I got yeah. six more of those because that's what yeah. we. Um, luckily, we didn't have to completely reinvent the boat. Like we kind of work similar programs in Las Vegas, so we took our processes from before. We met with Mia, kind of just implemented some of their stuff, and yeah. the canvas bags I think work perfectly. And they're easily replaceable. They don't take up a lot of space. Right? Yeah. So, right. Yeah. Awesome. All right, number eight, LHA report. The update on the operations and expense report. Um. Not a lot of changes. We took a couple of med units that are done off, adding a couple more. Um, <laughs> uh, you can see it's looking strong. We do have wait list open, so that is helping. Um, in my notes, you'll see that we've rented a couple of the units. We've had movements even from the time this report at the end of the month to today. We had a movement yesterday and we're at the suite. So we are moving through and getting these units reoccupied. It's been a slow term of units waiting. On appliances, Robin Peter to pay Paul, you know, taking a unit out of a down unit to have an occupied unit to have a fridge or a stove, buying floor models, whatever we can do to get through. Um, but a lot of these units are now coming together. We're getting our parts in. These units, um, I'm walking with maintenance when I'm doing these quarterly walks, checking the units, quality control. So these units are getting done and they're being done the right way. Um, so. The only thing, and I think it's a mistake. Kendra, and I may have sent it to you too, is when we start seeing that a, a stove is not going to be available for three months, because that's the reality. Um, but let's say there's one that's a step above that's available now. We're, we're going to need to start doing some financial calculations to go, what are we, you know, just getting the least expensive stove may not be the right answer if you can't get them for three months. Yep. 
So we're going to have to start being really creative and looking at the financial analysis on does it make more sense to buy one for $400 more because we're going to be able to recoup that money faster than, than what we're losing by having the, the unit vacant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we'll do is when we do the village space rate syndication, we did it with Aspen Meadows. We stored 10, 10 fridges, which really helped out. We used all yes. those 10 fridges, but we did pour back some stuff and didn't let them be recycled. Or, <laughs> so we'll do it again with um, fridges, stoves, microwaves, stuff like that. So we have them on hand just in case this happens again. For property updates, the Via Shuttle, like she said, going great. A lot of good um, feedback from the residents who have participated. Talk to some Village Place residents who did not take partake in the first one, but they're planning to go this week because this week is the Walmart, and that's what everybody was like. They really want to get to those Walmarts. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and we are having a third shuttle in December for a special shop shopping trip for them. Um, and in terms of uh, like evictions and that, is it still is it two a week? Is it we are two. Is it more? No? No. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're only allowed two, but we haven't had any for a few weeks. Okay. Um, we are seeing that slow down. Um, we are working a few right now with ERAP, which is the rental assistance, trying to get them rental assistance so we don't have to go to evictions. So we have those on the back burner if they cannot get funds. Um, but we're down to just a handful of owing multiple months of rent, um, okay. nothing, nothing in the thousands like we were seeing earlier this year. Um, I think we have one pending nuisance, two pending nuisance cases at two different properties, but the residents have kind of quieted down, not causing an issue, so those are on the back burner too. But nothing, nope, nothing on my court schedule for the, for the rest of the year so far. <laughs> so that has really slowed down. No evictions pending either. All grant evictions have taken place. Any other questions on that? Mm -hmm. All right. Jump to the page of You're on mute.
25% of what they collect. So whatever they collect, we would see 75%, they would see 25%. Um, and then we would end up writing that other 25% off. Um, so, so that's kind of where it stands. Um, did you guys have any questions on that? So you, you mentioned that it's fees or fines. I mean, this is, is are a lot of these that's out there on receivables, is it like damage to the units that we're trying to collect or? Yes, okay. it's damage. Um, because we don't get a really large security deposit, it's usually $500, um, that will either take care of the past due rent or um, a lot of it's you know, cleaning yep. and that okay. is what these large, large costs are. So like the Aspen Meadows neighborhood over 90 is $44,108, is that? Yes, that's the best. Is that just one, one unit, mainly, or? Well, there's 10 past due clients, um, so the majority of that balance is yes. Okay. From that, but there are a couple others in there. Okay. That make up that balance. So 46 is what is due, but there's 10 past due tenants that have balances. They could be small, they could be less. Yep. Um, and we'll take a look at, you know, if it's even worth. Um, I'm working on the write-off um, individuals. You know, we have seven and a half, six dollars being so on that. Um, a majority of the lower dollars that we made just write off. Okay. Ready to move on? Let's go up to then the, the property financials. Oh, I think you're on mute. Um, yeah, yes. There you go. Did I click a button? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking? Um, don't touch my keyboard. Um, so I did highlight, you know, we are over on every single budget for vacancies. Um, and some of them are, are pretty quite over. This is only the third quarter, so we still have the fourth quarter to go. So, and I know there's, there's problems with getting Appliances and getting getting cows. Um, I do think we now that I have kind of a ad hoc report that I can pull down. We probably need to start looking at those vacancies and monitoring them closer to know, you know, are they ready to flip? Are they ready to go over? And, and kind of start documenting what 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 problems we're having. You know, are can we not house it because there is nobody? Like nobody on the wait list can get off, or they have six months, um, and then and then what our plan is after that? You know, what do we go to next? What waiting list do we go to next? Um, so we do need to probably sit down and figure out a better way to fine tune how we can manage each one of those units. Um, there is some overage on the Aspen Meadows neighborhood that is obviously due to the um, insurance. Anything that's over at those. And the suites actually isn't over, but they actually have insurance repairs as well. The reason they're not over is because we haven't had security there for a while. So security was um, a big, big expense for the suites. But you don't see it there yet because we haven't incurred those costs. Um, for the lodge, you know, we are getting close. Um, we're actually under our net income on that one. Um, but we did find that the um, it may change come the next report because we did find that the uh, the I can't even like think of the word the, the people that we went out to to get the actual um, to start doing the rad conversion and do the uh, K what is it called. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. For the for the conversion the the evaluation we had done for the Hearthstone and the Lodge. The PCM. Yeah, anybody's an accident we got charged to them and actually LHDC was supposed to pay for that, so we are reimbursing um, the lodge money for that. So that'll probably bring us up in balance. Um other than that, everything's I mean Pretty good as far as um, we, I did um, review a lot of what Lisa set up for the budgets in 2023 um, and reviewed the budgets in 2022. 
to the CAA go forward with purchasing these items in 2022 because we have some extra funds there right now and we haven't spent in certain areas. So, you know, if you need a key machine, get a key machine. If you need a, a you know, there was actually the fall, I think it's Fall River, we budgeted for a copier, but they never got a copier. So, um, I, ha I have a, you know, something out to our contact that we're using for the city's copiers now um, to get them a copier in place. Copier scanner or printer type thing. Does anybody have questions? No, I think you answered them all. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know what, then the vouchers, you know, we're staying pretty steady around um, our total vouchers and our total count, but we just can't seem to get to that 420 number. Like, we have it, we have people that have issued vouchers, but we can't ever get to that number. Um, we have people coming off. We, I, you know, I know they're proactively, and now we have another big wait list to start working through, but I know they sent like 20, 25 letters, and like only maybe six people responded. So, and that was off our old wait list, not the new wait list for the people that actually came in and had to be, you know, long and specific. Um, so, I don't know if uh, Tracy's probably already left, but. Um, we're trying to get bigger. <laughs> it's just it's a little it's a little hard. People can't find places. Mm -hmm. um, but we did, and I don't know if that was in this one or in the last one, but we did go to we did have the commissioners approve um, for us to go up to 105 percent of market. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we will start doing that. And what that means is we're we were going at 100 percent market rent, but we can go to 105 to maybe assist more families with being able to vouch it up within our community. And that just happened this last, this last council meeting. So. That's so do we just actually have people out there who are not really willing to do the voucher process as far as the public goes? Yeah, you know, some of them may have already left. Some of them, you know, with our last um, wait list, we had a lot of out-of-staters, you know, and they may not have, and I can't speak to who was all reached out to, but I know that 200, we exhausted that 200, and so we're now looking at the, the new, the new list. Are you talking about properties? Mm -hmm. Homeowners, do they, are they just not going to do this? I mean, that's a guaranteed income, but to a certain point. Um, I think there's some that are, you know, right now is an interesting time because um, when interest rates tend to go up, um, what you tend to see is more people living in the rental world versus the first thing else. So I think that's a pressure that's impacting vouchers right now in that rental rates are going up because there's high demand. And, and so typically, you know, I think what we were seeing a year or so or what we were seeing about a year ago is more people were interested in it because the vacancy rates were um, lower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I think it'll be interesting to see when we get more of these units coming online and what that does to the overall vacancy rate in the community and does that create more interest. It's, it's I mean, the world's wacky right now. It's kind of hard to, mm -hmm. to understand. You know, we've talked about getting people into age-restricted units and the impact of the economy and inflation and what that's having. Mm -hmm. So I think you have all of these factors in play to where someone may find something, but then because of the inflation and the cost of living in Colorado, they may choose to, I want to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many different variables in play that it's hard to really pinpoint right now, at least in my mind. Well, and another thing we probably need to circle back with, and I'm going to talk with Tracy in the next couple of weeks, is because we can't seem to get over the 400 mark, even though we have people issued vouchers, they just can't find stuff, or they're getting extensions, is that we take in the points, we make those our vouchers, so we can voucher up. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we currently have 10 vouchers that are pulling vouchers right now um, that we could absorb. <clears throat> and those would become our vouchers and, and, and we would report them under us. So I think we need to probably come to that determination that we need to probably absorb those vouchers. But I want to talk to Tracy to make sure she hasn't reached out to a bunch of new people and they're 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 going come home <laughs> and they're able to vouch her up. Okay. All right, so next item update from your senior direct director. I think I've covered most of my issues in this conversation, so I'm good. Yep. And I've got a meeting and I've got a head. Yes, so any other business? Did we talk last time about extending this to 11 o'clock? Yeah. Are we so. going to do that? Yeah, let's do it. Starting December. Let's do December, yeah. And then we need the second hours. Tuesday. Yeah, uh, third. We're on the third now, right? No, it's it. No. It started, it, it, if you look at the minutes, it's starting in December. We'll do the minutes say second Tuesday. 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 Second Tuesday. Second Tuesday. Yeah. Second Tuesday. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, we're on the third right now. We're on the third right now. It's the yeah. meeting to the second. The board of commissioners will start meeting on the third. So, I mean, I can't meet the 20th. So, we, we are scheduled for the 13th. If we go in December, the second is the 13th. Do you want to do it? Let's have it on the second or the Yeah. Yeah. Second, we decide. Yeah. That's yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. Let's see my calendar. So then going forward, then it's going to be a second Tuesday instead of a third. Oh. Okay. Until the two hours. Yeah, let's, get, yeah, let's, let's, let's do it for two hours. It's, I don't think we've finished an hour and a half later. No, I think it's better to buffer in more time and, and end early. Then yeah. to, to And that's a garbage price next month. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that then. All right, let's All right. adjourn at ten forty nine.